The following production is part of the Play Some Video Games Podcast Network. And welcome to Board with Video Games, the gaming podcast that strives for the right balance of coverage for games you play on your table and on your television. You can think of us as the Alex Lyson and Getty Lee of gaming podcasts. We're a proud member of the PSVG Podcast Network and thrilled to be part of the Dice Tower Network as well. I am one of your hosts, Kyle, and joining me on this co-op adventure, the guy whose catalog goes more than 150 songs deep. Josh, how are you doing this morning? Well, it's weird. Uh, <laughs> I'm tired. The house is very active, used to uh, being tired, but on the other end of the day, not necessarily <laughs> at the start. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's going well. I, I don't think that you will ever want me to have a 150-song catalog, though. Nobody needs to hear me singing or playing any instrument. <laughs> awesome. Hey, you know, Alex Lifeson, Getty Lee, both wonderful musicians on their own. But everyone knows the most talented member and the true backbone of Rush was their drummer, Neil Pert. And the person filling in that role this week is none other than William Herkowitz, writer of all things theoretical physics, AI, astronomy, brewing, and of course, board games. William, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. And thanks for appreciating that I am the best member of Rush. Um <laughs> Yeah, for your audience, so I'm William Herkovitz. I live and work in Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, if you have heard of me, which I really doubt that you have, I review board games for Popular Mechanics, and I curate our 50 Best New Board Games list, which gets circulated around the internet a surprising amount every two to three months when we usually do an update. Awesome. Well, hey, we're super excited to have you on the show. Uh, just have to ask a quick question off the top about your 50 Best New Board Game list. Why is the word new in there? Uh, don't, it's the news, my friend. Uh, news is important for the people that publish everything that I write. Um, you know, there's a lot of really great board games that go back through history and especially the last 30 years. This list is really just trying to capture the, you know, the best and brightest that's been coming out over the last couple of years. Excellent. Cause I, I think that was the, when we saw the list the first time in December, we're like, Hey, some of these games are a couple of years old. Is that still new? <laughs> yeah, you're definitely you're definitely right on that. It's definitely that's still not new. There's a couple of games on there that I think the oldest one was published in 2014, and I'm, this year I'm working on trying to trim everything so the oldest game is from 2007. I think it definitely makes sense though, from like a you know if you look at a new style or like the hobby board game idea and think of that as being new, then I think that totally it totally works. I think it's totally new fine. To you, yeah, new to you is still new. I think in in most people's mindsets, like. I get it. All right. So, hey, as always, we appreciate all of you joining us this week. As always, if you have questions, feedback, suggestions, hit us up at Board with VG on Twitter or check out all of the awesome things Josh posts over on the Instagram. Also, Board with VG. As I stated at the top, we are a part of the PSVG podcast network and PSVG is on Patreon. So we are thrilled with the support you have given us there. Uh, and if you'd like to monetarily support what we do, you can find us there at patreon.com slash PSVG. But the most important thing is just that you listen and maybe share what we do with someone else who might also enjoy it. And we are a member of the Dice Tower Podcast Network. So if you enjoy our conversations about board games and would like to dive deeper into that world, we encourage you to check out the Dice Tower Podcast as well as all the other members of the network. No matter what type of board games you enjoy, there is going to be a podcast on the network for you so enough of this housekeeping stuff william as our guest what have you been playing on your tabletop sir well dudes i have been playing some spooky scary games recently over the last two weeks i've broken out nemesis by awakened realms and betrayal legacy by avalon hill have you guys played either of those games well i have betrayal legacy and it's been a constant fight to get a good game group together so i think i'm i'm curious do you have like a traveling game group with you? How do you get like a game like Betrayal Legacy to like the table? So I have um, a couple of different groups of people that I play with. Mostly people that meet the criteria of they'll read the rules before they show up at my house. <laughs> um, so I've only actually played Betrayal a couple of times so far. And, you know, there's there's an option within the game for uh, different people to take up different roles. And, then, you know, these different members of families as time goes on. So I'm assuming some of that's probably going to happen. Gotcha. 
Perfect. Yeah, so but before I talk about these games, I wanted to actually ask you guys a question. So have you guys ever played a scary board game like that actually frightened you in the same way that like a terrifying movie or like a jump scare heavy video game could frighten you? And if, if not, do you think it's possible for a game to really actually scare you? When I was a kid, we had the Nightmare board game, the VHS uh, tape one. Uh, and that game was literally made to be full of jump scares. And I would say, like, maybe the first, like, five plays, you you would get, like, legitimately scared while you're p- taking a turn. Because the game out pushes, like, roll fast, roll fast, because you have a timer ticking down on the screen. So, like, while you're constantly trying to complete this objective, it's very easy to get distracted and forget a guy is about to, to like, jump onto the screen in the middle of one of your turns. Um but I think that's probably, for me, the only, like, scary game. Like, I have played the original, like, Betrayal at House on the Hill, but I don't find it scary or Mansions of Madness scary. The theme is intended to be scary, but I don't know that it's ever gotten me terrified. Kyle, yeah, I don't I don't know that I have, like, I'm kind of the same way, though, when I read books. Like, it's very hard for a, to, for me to actually feel any fraught from a scary book. Uh, so definitely, you know, movies and video games, I have felt that way. There are video games that I've played that I haven't finished because I was like, nah, I'm just not going to do this. Like, I'm, I'm far too scared to continue this game. But from a board game perspective, uh, I think it would be challenging, but I'm intrigued by that question because now it makes me think that maybe I'm wrong and maybe I just haven't played the right spooky board games. I don't know if you're right or if you're wrong. Uh, I got a first, I got a question actually to go back to you, Josh. Do you think that that game would have scared you if you were playing it as an adult or do you think that being a kid was part of the thing that scared you? Well, so I don't know. I have, they like republished it as Atmosphere and Atmosphere is pretty hokey. Like it's still like the same like video, so it didn't necessarily age well. But um, we were like having a Twitter conversation with Restoration Games, uh, and I had mentioned that I would love to see it get republished, and they were like, oh, it's getting republished, just not by us. So I'm curious what the new version will be like, and if it's going to go for that like jump scare thing again, because I could totally see being scared. Uh, it's also about environment, though, because the first game is like, turn off all your lights play right next to the TV. So that's your light for the game. So I think like if you can create the right atmosphere, but like playing Mysterium in a well-lit house is not going to be scary at any point. Yeah, I I think there is something like some indelible factor of atmosphere or immersion that you get really easily with like a movie and you can get somewhat more easily with... um, I th- and most of the movies are the things that really scare me. I'm actually reading a frightening book right now called The Terror, uh, and I, I actually could find it very scary as well. But um, yeah, I'm not sure if if a game like you know, no, at the end of the day, even during the scariest part of the game, you're still like looking at your friend from over the board, right? And yeah. he's like not dying, so I don't know how scared you can get. That said, I think that Nemesis is probably the closest to like a frightening horror filled game that I have ever played. Nice. So basically in, in, in Nemesis, the game has like the plot of like the original alien, except that you have like up to five Sigourney Weavers that are all running around, like waking up from cl- cryo sleep on a starship and like pretty quickly finding out that, uh oh, something terrible is happening. Uh, and when you play, it's, it's somewhat in the style of Battlestar Galactica, which full disclosure, I actually have not played that game. Um, but where in addition to, you know, everyone just needing to survive the board game, you all have secret objectives, most of which are harmless, like sending a signal or, or making sure you're headed back to Earth. But then there's the, there's a chance that at least one person has, you know, is up to something devious. So in my last game, that was me. And my objective was to make sure player three was dead. Uh, and I got away with it in the cruelest way possible. It was really fun by abandoning my buddy in a room with one of the aliens. And then I tossed a grenade in over my shoulder for good measure. It was pretty great. Um, but when we, you know, when we broke it out, I was pretty skeptical, uh, you know, when we started learning the rules because it's a pretty complex game. And I have to say though, I actually really loved it. I found it to be one of the most immersive games I've ever played, not in spite of the sheer volume of rules, but maybe because of them. So you have a lot of options and choices each turn and, and the designers really did a good job in kind of building you into the game. Uh, and so, I don't know, I found that because we were so invested in the game, because we were built into the game. Also, when my group played, we had the Alien Isolation soundtrack on in the background. And we did like most of our turns, like D&D style, where we were describing in detail what we were doing and trying to do our best to, you know, cinematize the game. I found it pretty scary. Um, nice. And I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I have read some reviews that are, that are knocking the game for two reasons, which is that 
it's it's it, you know it's pretty absurdly difficult to win and there's a lot of randomness that's built into the game so like the aliens you encounter that's kind of random how they might move uh when you can spawn them but i have to actually say that both the difficulty and the randomness kind of added to the horror of the game so you know you don't really know what's going to happen next and you're pretty sure that if you make the wrong move you could like die in a snap and even if you make the right move you're still not safe and so i, I thought that was uh two really great parts of the game does death um, mean game now, over in that game? In death means game over. There's this like kind of, uh, I have to say, kind of BS mechanic where like the first person that dies can be the alien, but then like the second person that dies just like has to watch. Uh, so, but yeah, death is 100% game over, just like it is in real life. <laughs> Yeah. So you had mentioned that, you know, the game is com- challenging. Is it challenging from a just the game is very much stacked, seems to be partially stacked against you? Or is it challenging also from a rules and understanding perspective? Because if I recall, so this game was on Kickstarter, I feel like last year. And I feel like it's supposed to be like a really heavy as far as like mechanically driven game. Is that true and accurate? No. So it is a pretty complex game. The thing is that the rules are intuitive in some way. So there, there is a lot of rules that you have to go through. We definitely spent an hour learning the rules. But once we got going, there was like occasional checks back to the manual. But for the most part, it like things made sense within the game. You go into a new room and you don't have to remember that you're rolling for noise to see if there are any aliens around you. So that was... That I wouldn't say was too difficult. I thought the game actually, given just the sheer complexity and volume of rules, it did a really, really good job with, with really integrating them. Definitely the game is stacked against you. Every single thing is stacked against you. Like you'll have moments in the game where you, so for the most part, you draw like five cards and those are like the actions you get to take during your round. And as you take like different wounds or damage, um, maybe you, you're only drawing like three cards. Maybe you have cards in your hand that aren't doing anything that stay in your hand because you've been infected by the alien. Um, so everything about the game is stacked against you. And as soon as you start losing, it's, you, you got to get really lucky to, to actually manage to survive. In that game where I betrayed my friend, uh, he played a card in which he like, held me back and I got attacked by the alien just like a little bit. I got this little infection and as the very end of the game after I had completed my objective, objective which is making sure that he was dead, I, I'm in this escape pod, I'm going back to Earth and the, you go through this, you know, you, you, you basically pull cards from your deck to see if any of the infection cards come up. And sure enough, despite the fact that I played as well as I could have, I like the alien burst from my chest and I was dead. And that was, yeah, I have not actually won any of the games yet, but I had an incredible amount of fun losing, which is pretty rare for me. That's good. Excellent. That sounds like an awesome game. Yeah. Now, Betrayal Legacy. So I've only played the first two games in the Legacy campaign and I'm, I'm having fun playing it so far. It's definitely not as immersive or scary. I don't, I mean, it doesn't, it's not a scary game in, in a lot of ways. And with its, you know, as with its precursor in Betrayal, you, you have friends, you're investigating a haunted house, you find some items, you find some spooky stuff, and then eventually this haunt phase begins where one person usually goes full traitor and you know, kind of duke it out. Um, if I'm being less effusive than I was with Nemesis, maybe it's because I think I need to give the top of the game a little bit more time before my, you know, half-baked opinions really start to congeal. Uh, but right now, the non-scary part of the game where you're like investigating the haunted house, it kind of seems somewhat perfunctory and I'm like I'm waiting for like the real fun start stuff to do that. Nice. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting that to the table. We're trying to schedule like a game day. It might be tabletop day that we play it, but <clears throat> I was such a big fan of the first game that I couldn't not grab it. So hopefully we get uh, a good amount of people together to play that. The only problem is getting the multiple plays after the first initial play, <laughs> which is can be a bum. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem with legacy games. That and then you have to destroy components of the games. And I yeah, just, it just it, like it hurts. It hurts to do it to rip that card. I can't. I don't have it in me. Yeah, yeah, that's tough. Uh, awesome. Okay, I'm gonna move. Uh, let me let's let's talk about my board games or lack of board games. So, do you guys ever have that time where you want to play board games? so bad and everyone just bails on you or plans fall out it's that that was my day yesterday i had like three solid plans fall through because i had backup plans for when my when i knew someone was going to cancel on me so i'm so sorry (laughs) i'm I'm like no board games no board games so what do i do so i reach out to my buddy uh lucas from one of our our, um, co-friendly sister podcasts uh flux to pose and i said lucas we play pc games together i'm like we need to play some pc games tonight but they need to be board games he's like all right i'm on board so we figure he bought a humble bundle recently that had a bunch of board games and one of them was 
Pathfinder adventure card game. So I'm familiar with the game because I own it. <clears throat> I go on eBay, I buy a $2 version, but it doesn't arrive in time, so I buy a $15 <laughs> version on Steam to play. <clears throat> uh, speaking of, my code did show up while we were playing, so I'm going to give away a code for Pathfinder adventure card game at some point on our Twitter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we decide we're, chat- we're chatting over Discord. We're talking about it. We do the tutorial together. So we do. he does it on his at the same time as I do it on mine. So we go through four tutorials. It's probably about a half an hour of time. To then find out the game is single player. <laughs> Seriously? It, it does not support online play. And um, we're both... where Our minds are exploding. We don't know what the heck happened. We don't know how he missed it. <laughs> He's like, how did I not scroll down to see? If so, you had asked me to bet a sizable amount of money that that game would have been multiplayer, I would have bet a sizable <laughs> amount of money. I can't believe that. Yeah, so that was a, a big old bummer. So I said, all right, well, he has like hundreds of games in his Steam library. I have like 30. So I said, look through your board games on your, in your library. We'll play something. He's like, well, I have Twilight Struggle. I'm like, okay. I don't, I've never played that. He's like, neither have I. He's like, okay. It's 10 bucks on Steam. I don't want you to buy it. I'm going to buy Twilight Struggle. So we play, we play Twilight Struggle. No tutorial. We just jump <laughs> right into it. <laughs> this game <laughs> is insane. <laughs> the, when you go into it with no knowledge, I'm sure this game is great. And I think we still had a fun time laughing at like how terrible we were and what the heck we were didn't know what we were doing or uh, so i'll try to explain i'm going to explain to you what twilight struggle is from my understanding of the two games we played <laughs> it's all the simplicity of the cold war yes As, like i said at the end i said they say the cold war was boring well they haven't played this game so they have no idea <laughs> it, it's basically so you get a you you get the map of the world someone's playing the united states someone's playing the ussr and For me, the game I would compare to most is Risk, where it's similar to Risk as you're occupying um, territories or nations or um, different parts of the world, and you're you're occupying them for power. That's how the game. That's like the like a very very dumb way to describe this game because that's the minimum of the game is just occupying territories. Uh, what you have in your is you have all these cards in your hand that are um, actual world events that have happened, and they have special abilities on them. Uh, and when you play these cards, you get you pick a card, and it gives you four different options to do something with that card, which is mind-boggling on its own, because now you have to decide if you're going to play the event card, if you're going to use it to um, occupy territories, if you're going to use it for the space race, which is another like sub-game happening while you play. And it takes place over three different phases of the war, early, mid, and end of the war. Uh, we did not get to the end of the war at, on either plays because the second play, I accidentally put the world into nuclear war and didn't realize I was not leading the points. So I just <laughs> killed myself and lost. <laughs> this is how this game played for us. Is we just didn't know what the heck we were doing <laughs> the whole time. Uh, but that being said, for the at least for the PC, it was very easy to navigate. Um, you kind of knew what you were doing, even though we didn't know necessarily what we were doing. It was easy to navigate the menus, um, see how many turns were left, see who had the most um, uh, control over the territories, and uh, eventually, it's a game that I want to revisit because I think we really did get a general idea of it at the end. And you know, I don't know the board game itself must be incredibly tough it's it's definitely a deep strategic game uh, so i don't know if you can upscale risk and difficulty but that's what i would imagine this game was like kyle have you played this game i played this game uh, a couple times but it hasn't been for oh geez six or seven years that i have played it it was one of the, it was actually when i was just getting into hobby board games i had a friend who had it. it's like you should play this with me i was like okay and yeah it, it was the first game that I went completely, not completely over my head, but at the time, based off my knowledge of tabletop games and board games, I was I was a little out of my depth. Um, one of my favorite things about this game, though, is if you read the Board Game Geek uh, profile of it in the description, these this sentence is like, these two sentences always have cracked me up. 
It says, Twilight Struggle inherits a, its fundamental systems from the card-driven classics We the People and Hannibal, Rome versus Carthage. It is a quick-playing, low-complexity game in that oh, tradition. <laughs> lies. Lies. <laughs> and I, I remember, because I, I very much remember that, and I was like, what? Am I just not smart? So, yeah, uh-huh. I really do want to play this game again, um, because, like I said, I haven't played it in years. But I my first foray into it uh, was not ideal. It wasn't great, but it's, I think it was just because it was just way too advanced for what my skill and knowledge levels at the time were. So, Gotcha. William, have you played this one? Yeah, I have. So first off, that's what happens when the people who are selling the game get to write the text on the box <laughs> online instead of the people that designed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I actually, so I played this in a thematically perfect time. I played when I used to live in Berlin, Germany, and I played Twilight Struggle uh, on the 21st and 25th anniversary of the Ber- fall of the Berlin Wall, and I think it's 2004, with wow. my Dutch friend Lucas. And one of us had like a Russian hat, and we- I played one time as the Americans and one time as the Russians. Uh, and I, don't, I remember we would wake up, Lucas was a kindergarten teacher, and I was a freelance journalist. So we would wake up and we'd start play at like eight o'clock in the morning. And I remember it'd be like, Four o'clock in the afternoon, we're like, we have to finish this game. We spent all day playing the game, but it was really fun. You know, it was definitely very good play. Yeah, it has um, asynchronous play. So, like, we saw like a three-hour timer for turns, and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> what, did, what did we get ourselves into? <laughs> but luckily, you know, luckily we could just play live. Uh, it gave me like civilization worries. Like right away, I'm like, is this? Civilization, the board game? No, they have that too. <laughs> also, um, I'll say another thing about uh, uh, Twilight Struggle is that you can really embarrass yourself if the person you're playing with has a much stronger grasp of history. I remember we'd yes. be like playing these cards. I'm like, I, I don't, I don't know what this is about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that definitely happens a lot. <laughs> yes, uh, it was. I mean, I want to revisit it, so I wouldn't turn anyone away. Um, <laughs> But I can't speak on the physical board game side of that, so I don't want to say go buy the board game, but I can tell you at least the a PC version of it is something I'll play again. I think there is a tutorial if you do like single player, so I'll probably do that next. <laughs> and to end my night, I did purchase Scythe because it's 10 bucks right now. It's half off on Humble Bundle. And I, I have Scythe the board game. I haven't gotten it to the table yet because it's also uh, a game that's, I think, intimidating to a lot of people because of... Um, just the, just the sheer size of it. Um, so I did the tutorial last night, and man, there's a lot going on in that game. So I'm gonna do the tutorial again before I fully play a game. Um, so I'm not really, I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm just gonna say that I do have it now on PC. So if people want to play. <laughs> I'm on Steam. <laughs> so I'm gonna just turn it over to Kyle, who actually has um, can bring it back to physical board games, I believe. <laughs> well, just real briefly, uh, yeah. I you know. I think you know that I really enjoy Scythe. Um, I do yes. think, though, that once you play it once or twice, you will realize that it is actually, and maybe it's similar to Nemesis in this way, that it seems kind of overwhelming to learn. But once you've learned it, it is very, I don't want to say straightforward, but you kind of always know like what your options are. And like once you start playing, like it's really not too complicated. That sounds good. So um, for me, it was a uh, playing some games that I'd already played type of weekend. I um, was sitting down, and this is the thing that I always get into with my partner, and we. <laughs> this is always the hardest part. We sit down, I was like, all right, I really should play some board games for the podcast. Okay, what are we going to play? Well, I probably should play something new. All right, well, are you going to learn them? Uh, well, I'm the one who has the podcast, so I guess that's my responsibility, right? <laughs> yep, yes. it is. Oh, man. <laughs> well, then I was going to play Wingspan, but then... Yes. <laughs> Did you I open keep, it? No, I haven't opened it yet, but I keep <laughs> looking at those prices on eBay, and I'm like, man, maybe I'm not going to play Wingspan. Um, So that game just sat by. So I just pulled out some oldies but goodies that I hadn't played in a while because I wanted to get back to them. And they're both games that I had. Well, what I was going to do was play Terraforming Mars. So mm-hmm. I opened it, started reading the rules, and said, I want to play a Euro, but I don't want to learn a Euro right now. So I'm going to put this back, and I'm just going to play great. Gra- gra- Great Western Trail, because I really adore that game. And there's something about a game that has you, if you were to tell someone you are going to play a board game and in this board game, you are going to deliver some cattle. And that is what you're going to do. You're going to try to get the best <laughs> price for your cattle that you can. I, I feel like that is something that just people would be like, oh, why am I? What do I? Why do I want to do this? But that's one of the things I love about Great Western Trail is that it's so much fun. You're delivering cattle. And we've talked about, like I said, I'm not going to go totally in depth again. But I think that game is just 
a really solid Euro with really great mechanisms that I just, every time I play it, I try to figure out how do they make delivering cattle so darn fun. So, William, have you ever played Great Western Trail? Yes, I have. Delivering cattle is very fun. It's core. Who doesn't want to deliver cattle? As soon as I see a big hunk of beef, I just want to move it from one place to another. <laughs> Wait, I want to, okay, so I have a question for you guys. When you are learning a game for the first time, you're going just straight into the rule book? Well, it depends. I usually try to find a YouTube video, but there's it depends on like who is doing those YouTube videos. Like, will depend on whether or not I uh, watch it or not. So, uh, I typically try to first go to YouTube, um, but then I typically try to find like follow read my instruction book while I'm watching the video, or read or at least glance through it before I watch the video because I like to kind of have a little bit of an idea of what's going on. So I kind of do both. Yeah. I found... uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead, Josh. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> I was just gonna say, with us, it's it's so uh, it's harder to get games on the table. So like the one time I did pre-read, which was um, Wasteland Express Delivery Service, um, we just never got it to the table. So basically, I I wasted an hour of my night learning how to play it for the next day. Um, but there something no we talked about on the podcast was um, Fog of Loves. Uh, uh, like rules are basically like open the game and eat. We have tutorial cards built into the deck. So you, the first time you play the game, you're actually playing the rules as you play, which I thought was really unique and, and kind of appeal to the way we typically will like open up a game and just read out of the book. So I've had the least success just opening the rules book, especially when I have a bunch of people and just trying to go through the rules with everyone. I, I, what I, cause I'm playing these like new board games, like basically like every other game that I'm playing is something that I'm playing for the first time. Uh, I found that if there's a YouTube video, it doesn't matter how bad the YouTube video is. I just make everyone in my group watch that. And if it's like really bad, when we get down to the table, uh, I will have read the rule book and I can like flesh out everything else. Um, but yeah, I have, it's for me, it's, if I send a PDF file to someone, they're never going to look at it. But if right. I send a YouTube video, even if it's like 40 minutes, they'll watch that YouTube video. Yeah. Yeah. I just very much feel like it's, I don't know. I just have the sense of obligation of like, I have to be the one, especially when I'm encouraging other people to play a game that I have to be the one to know. And it's my responsibility to teach. And I feel like most of my friends feel that way too, that it's my responsibility to do that. So yeah, I very much am. I will read a rule book and watch a YouTube video. I might send it out and encourage them to watch it before we play a game, but most of them aren't going to do that. <laughs> but so what are your thoughts, though, on Great Western Trail? Do you, do you enjoy it? That one to me? Yeah. Sorry, going to you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. You know, it's been a while since I've played it. Um, So I'm not sure how much I have to really like what how well of a well informed opinion that I'll have about it now. I remember when I did play it, I thought that it was extremely good for like a heavy game that you yeah. would want to bring that you'd want like self-identified board game nerds to sit down at the table with you devote some time into going to the rules and then playing it all the way through. I, I thought that it was pretty fun for that. Um, I, I, you know, at this point I have like a, like a list of games that uh, I know I'm only really going to be able to break out in like very specific circumstances when I have like four people that love games just as much as I do and are willing to devote like, like three hours of like really hardcore thinking uh, about strategy. And then I have to decide which are the best games to pick. And I'm not sure if Great Western Trail is now toward the top of that list anymore. I can understand that. Definitely. So yeah, so that was one of the games I played. And the other game I played because, you know, I can't ever go a board gaming session or board or a week of playing board games without playing something that incorporates some sort of deck building into it. Uh, so I busted out Mystic Veil vale, um, and kind of worked through that with some of the expansions. Uh, there are definitely more expansions I want to add to this, which is the reason that I decided to play it again because uh, I hadn't played it in a couple months and I, you know there's some new expansions that have been announced so I was like hey let's get back into this let's give it a whirl again and I just I really am still impressed with this game and especially I I, I wish I could just say that like the card crafting system that some might see it as a gimmick but it's just something I love I just love that system and I'm really excited for Edge of Darkness so it's supposed to be coming out in a couple months here which Hopefully that happens and we still get it in June or July whenever that's supposed to be delivered. But I really like this system. I want to see more games using this system. And I just, yeah, I, I could play this game, I think, pretty much all the time. I think it might be one of my five favorite games of all time now. I think it may have crept into there. Uh, and maybe it's because of that card crafting system, but I just really enjoy playing this game. And it's an easy recommend for me because the base game is really easy to understand. The first expansion is kind of like a nice little 
hey, this is just kind of more of the same. But then after that, the second expansion, the third expansion, they start adding more complexity and different things to it. So it's very much a game that you can get it at the ground floor. And if you want more later, there's definitely that more for you later option, which I always appreciate. Uh, so yeah, really just, I can't recommend Mystic Veil enough. It's going to kind of become, I think, along with like Dead of Winter, a game I probably just talked about way too much on this podcast. So those were the kind of the games I played. Like I said, just revisiting some old classics that I've been playing pretty regularly. How many people can you play Mystic Veil with? I've never played it. Uh, Mystic Veil plays up to four, um, but I think it definitely is best as a, like a two player game, but it does play up to four. So. All right. And with that, that's everything we've been playing on our tabletop. William, have you been playing anything on your television or monitor or handheld? Yeah, dudes, I have been playing uh, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's kind of a, a, an elite game only a couple people have heard of it at this point. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but at, le- at least in solo mode, I, I, not, to, not to just tamp down on, like, on fear, uh, but I find playing that game heart-poundingly frightening. Like when you're all by yourself, and there's danger that's all abounding you. I don't know. I just I, I love that. Um, and I've also been playing Into the Breach. Uh, have you guys played that game? No. <laughs> no. Aware of it. Have heard regularly how amazing it is. Not a game that I've played at all, though. You guys have to play this game. So it's a turn-based strategy game by the same folks that did FTL. And I, I'm God. I love both of those games so much. So Breach reminds me of Advanced Wars mixed with like chess puzzles. So basically, like. Each campaign, you're fighting these like gross bug aliens with three mechs, uh, and all your mechs have like different abilities. Some of them like push enemies, some of them throw enemies, some do melee attacks, some do different types of long range attacks that either you know directly attack or push, etc. And you know your mechs, it's RBG style that you can upgrade them over time. But anyhow, in the campaign, you basically play a series of games that are like puzzles. So each mech can move and do one action per turn. And at the beginning of each turn, you get to see what like these bug aliens are going to attack and how they're going to attack. And so you're working out like how you can with the, your three moves and three attacks, how you can defend all your cities, how you can either push the bugs off a cliff or you can push them to places where they're not hitting any targets or at best you can push them into each other or push them so that they're actually going to be attacking one another. It's really awesome. You kind of have to like consider and study your moves before you act. It really does remind me a lot of chess puzzles, which I, I, I'm kind of addicted to. Uh, are you playing on PC or do you have a Switch? Uh, I've been playing on PC. Gotcha. All right. Very cool. Well, my video game talk will just be about The Division 2, I think. I, 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 well, I, I think we talked Anthem to death, so <clears throat> I don't know that I'll continue talking about Anthem too much, um, but I am still playing it. Um, but yeah, we jumped into the Division 2 over the past week. Uh, Kyle and I have the Gold Edition, so um, we've had access since, I want to say, Tuesday of last week. And yeah, I mean, if you like the Division, you're going to love the Division 2. <laughs> um, it's, more, it's more of the same, but um, something I heard someone say, uh, and I wish I would give them credit if I remember too, but um, if you remember the Division One, people kind of thought New York was a little samey. Everywhere you go, kind of looked the same. Um, but that's just how New York is. Like empty streets in New York all look the same. And the Division Two, they really changed up the atmosphere. Where, like, you might turn a corner and it might be a block that they show is completely abandoned by trash. Like, what would really happen in a situation like that? So there's just like trash all over the place, built up the sides of buildings obstacles in the street you might place find places that are overgrown with grass and there's like deer freely like walking around um the city in fact i i shot one while kyle and i were playing <clears throat> just to which see I, if i could <laughs> which i was very disappointed by your actions yes yeah, so, well i didn't do it again i didn't shoot <laughs> Wait, the Josh, I got a question. <laughs> yeah <laughs> you said in the first game it takes place in new york city and in the second game it takes place in a place that's overflowing with trash what's the difference <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they just didn't show it in the first one. <laughs> Got it. Fair enough. But that is a uh, very g- good question. <laughs> and it speaks to a lot about my first experience in New York City, which was during the trash strike, which was a terrible visit. <clears throat> uh, uh, they did change um, some things in the game that I don't like. Um, they changed the uh, modification to weapons. So, one, um, it's more difficult to... Uh, uh, to navigate that menu, which was a weird decision for them to do. Um, and two, you don't just find weapon mods um, in like stashes or off of enemies anymore. You have to 
use perks um, that you like achieve during the game to buy um, modifications, and, and that's kind of a uh, uh, something that I think that well, I don't know. I'm sure they did it on purpose, but I feel like that was a mistake as far as the modification system goes. Um, other than that, though, like Kyle and I, we got in a, um, a few hours the other night, and it feels really good co-op. It's definitely more difficult, I think, than the first division, especially since I played through the first division solo, uh, the whole story, and uh, I've already died so many times playing by myself solo here. I really feel like this game is built for co-op play, while you can play single player. It's one of those things where you do have to be uh, more methodical in how you approach every situation. And this game also throws more uh, encounters at you. So you're not just running through streets to get to objectives anymore. You're now running into the bad guys are called hyenas in this. Um, you're running into hyenas like every other block. Uh, and you can choose to uh, ignore them, but typically. Uh, that's a bad thing because if they are now behind you and you run into more, they will engage you as well. So it's better to take them on as you see them. But um, we'll talk more about the Division 2 as we play it more, but I'm enjoying the time I've spent with it so far. Uh, and that's pretty much it for games for me, Kyle. Yeah, uh, it's kind of the same boat. Uh, playing the Division 2, I think overall enjoying it, I think the one thing that is nice is that, you know, if you pick up a weapon and you try it and you don't like it, you can just switch to another weapon, which is kind of nice without having to go anywhere to do it. Anthem burn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the only thing I will say about it that is a bit frustrating is kind of how you unlock uh, your abilities in that, like I unlocked an ability and I used it and I liked it and it was great. <clears throat> I then unlocked another ability, which was the sonar pulse, which in the first division was something that people like kind of just spammed all the time and maybe relied on a little too heavily. Well, they nerfed the heck out of it. And it is basically, I don't want to say it's worthless, but it's really not all that helpful. And it has like a huge, like 115 second cooldown. <laughs> and it like, and it pulses like, it pulses the people like literally right in front of you that you can see, but like no one else. So you're like, oh, that was like completely worthless. Like I knew they were there. I was looking for other people that I couldn't see. But the range is so short. And so that was disappointing because, like, I spent that upgrade point and now I and I was like, oh, I have enough, you know, like points to go upgrade again. Well, no. Now, when you get a third one, you need a different currency to upgrade to get that a new perk. And you're like, well, what the heck? So that was a little disappointing. So that was a bit of a bummer. That's my only complaint. But, yeah, it's hard, uh, which is good. You have to be very methodical when you're playing it, especially by yourself. And um, but, yeah, enjoying my time. Haven't gotten too far into it. Um, had an update yesterday that was really annoying because it was like, hey, you can't update because, you know, here's this error. Then when you look up the error code, they're like, oh, it's because of your firewall. And it's like, well, I'm on my Xbox. Like, I don't know how that's going to help me here. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, but I just tried it like 14 times and then it finally worked. So that was great. I just kept retrying it and eventually worked because that was the advice online. We'll just okay. keep trying. Perfect. Thank you. That's great troubleshooting. Um <laughs> So it's that, a well-known fact that firewalls eventually just give up. They're like, fine, <laughs> come in. <laughs> okay. So that's what I've been playing. The only other thing I've really been playing that uh, is I've been playing a little more Apex Legends, and I was telling Josh a little bit before we jumped in to record that I think I have not played enough Apex Legends to stay up with my abilities compared to everyone else. When that game first came out, I had no problems and I was winning quite regularly. Now that I'm only playing it maybe once a week, it definitely is not happening that way anymore. Uh, definitely have, I have been surpassed in my skill by many, many players now. And that if I don't get into a firefight right away to get some, get some decent gear, um, I, I am definitely not going to win. Like I, if I'm on an even playing field, as far as like armor and weapons and all that good stuff, I have a good shot. But if I am disadvantaged in any way, there's just no way I'm going to clutch anything out anymore. It just isn't going to happen. So I, I will have to make a decision as to whether I care about how good I am in Apex Legends and, and play it more, or I'm fine with playing it and just losing a lot. So we'll see which way that goes. I think with the number of games that are out there to play, I feel like the answer is just I'm going to lose a lot more than I would like to. But that's okay. I still have fun playing with it. Uh, I think the characters are cool. I'm looking forward to kind of what they announce as far as their battle pass and their next character and how they're going to do all that more out of curiosity than anything about how they're going to handle those things because goodness knows their customizations are expensive uh, so i'll be very interested to see how the rest of that stuff goes so so that is kind of it for video games we will transition then to topic of the show but before we do william there's two questions i have for you and they're kind of the same question but i think it's important to give us some perspective as we move on to talking about your 50 best new board game list 
Well, we'll answer that same question twice then. <laughs> Perfect. Well, like I said, kind of the same. So, what is or what are, if you are able to pick one, what is your favorite board game of all time and your favorite video game of all time? Oh, uh, can I give you a top three board games? That works just fine. And also, I feel like any answer to this question is always so wishy-washy because, <laughs> I, I mean, how can you, like, like I like code names. I like Twilight Struggle. <laughs> Very different games. I would never play them with the same people. Probably wouldn't play them with the same people. And I like them for very disparate reasons. Right. So the but, games that I like kind of really display more of the mechanics that I think I really like and the games that display those mechanics the best. Can so I, I guess? That, is Monopoly one of them? <laughs> it's actually number three. No, okay. <laughs> um, so first one is Game of Thrones, the board game. Oh, I think we're in like the second edition now. That yeah. that one is my number one. Nice. Number two is Secret Hitler. And number three is Diplomacy, which is Whoa. from, I think, <laughs> roughly the same era as Monopoly. Yeah, it is. It's like Tom Vassell's most hated board game of all time. <laughs> he hates that game. Oh, okay. oh, well, sorry. It's I love really Tom Vassell. It. It. <laughs> it's fine. He can have one wrong opinion. I'm okay with that. But basically, yeah. that should just tell you that I like uncomfortably aggressive games, <laughs> uh, like including the mechanics of like traditional area control, and I like deduction, and I love flat out lying my heart out. I love <laughs> just when you're just deceiving someone, when you promise you won't move into Smolensk or into, into Nova Scotia or wherever, and the next turn, that's where you are. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. <clears throat> Favorite video games then? Oh, man, that one's even harder. I love Skyrim. I if, if, if your favorite video game is the video game that you just spent the most amount playing, then it's probably Skyrim or the original Halo. Those were both just such fun games. Um, and I don't, I, you know, I don't review video games, so all I can tell you is that I just love those games immensely. That is okay. That just liking something is good enough for us. So, man, I, I've always thought about getting Game of Thrones, the board game, but I've just never done it. But it's very good. It's uh, so good. I gotta tell it's you what so- happened to us. Our first gameplay, we folded the board wrong, and it split right in half. Oh my- <laughs> my ears it was it's the worst in fact we have a hard time reopening it because we know what's inside that box waiting for us <laughs> you told me that you didn't have any really true horror games that's one right there that's a horror story for sure yeah <laughs> i think now that i look at it because i'm looking it up here on board game geek i think the reason i don't have never gotten it is because it's three player minimum yeah yeah and that is always hard for me when it's three player minimum because then the wife is like, why aren't we playing this game? And it's like, well, because we can't, just the two of us. Yeah. So. Oh, it's best with the full player count, too. I I remember when I used to play the first edition. I probably did most of my plays on that. And with the first edition, if you didn't have the full player count, uh, the, game, the board would just become like totally skewed. Because the area control mattered a lot. And if you just march into House Baratheon and there's no one there, it's just not the same. I can understand that. I can understand that. And then Secret Hitler, really. Secret Hitler. Oh, all of these games, Diplomacy, Secret Hitler, and Game of Thrones, the board game, all of these games are just friendship breakers. <laughs> They're just games in which you just, you're just lying and deceiving and making promises and not falling through with them. No, Secret Hitler is one of the best games I have ever played. It might, you know, I, I put in Game of Thrones at number one, but it could easily be Secret Hitler for two reasons. Uh, the first of which is that I think it's an extremely well balanced game. So it takes this concept of social deduction and just distills it to its like purest element where there's just enough um, there's just enough like clues for that you can really figure out who the fascists are and really figure out who the uh, the liberals are, but you you have to work toward it and you actually have to use some uh, deduction and look at how people have been voting and whatnot. But this, the second reason why I really love this game is because I can break it out at a party with ten people that don't identify as board gamers and I can explain the rules to them in like maybe five minutes and I can get everyone to do the first play and they immediately want to do a second play and then they want to do a third play and then a fourth play. It's just so much fun and so easy to just grab new players in. Awesome. Well, that sounds pretty darn good. Um, all right. Man, now I, hmm, I was really wishy-washy on ever picking that game up, but now you're making it sound so good. I can attest. It's I can so say it, it's, it's a very, I've, we've played it. Uh, we play it. It's like one of those games where like, like what do we play now? Like we have like we just played a game. Like we play like at like Athenos or something. We're like what do we play now? And then my buddy's like Secret Hitler, right? Like everyone's like yes. It's very easy to just kind of use as like 
a filler game or um, something to do after a heavy game. Uh, and it's really fun, especially when you're when you're nominating as your chancellor, I think that is like you have to nominate with you or vice president or vice chair or something like that. Yeah, the chancellor. You the chancellor. Nominate. So that's that's really fun too when you're like trying to figure out who's working with who and who's trying to nominate a neutral chancellor so that they don't seem like they're guilty. It's That's a real fun game. Oh, man. Well, Deception Murder in Hong Kong has kind of always been my go-to for that style of game. Maybe I'll have to give Secret Hitler a shot. Definitely. The only thing is you can burn people out on it. Uh, I have a, a very close friend, my girlfriend, who will not play it anymore, basically. Because you get in these situations in the game where you have two people that just have to look at each other straight in the eyes and tell everyone that that person is a liar. And clearly yeah. one of them is not telling the truth. And you have to believe it. Because if you don't believe what you're saying, people can tell. So you just have to put your whole heart into either lying or just like looking around the table and being like, why don't you believe me? Can't you see what's happening, you fools? <laughs> oh, man. All right. So, listener, you may remember back on episode 63 of this show, we talked about a board game list printed in Popular Mechanics entitled The 50 Best New Board Games. And I'll admit, when I first saw the list, I wasn't expecting Popular Mechanics to deliver a really solid, you know, list of 50 board games. We were very, very audible about our surprise. On yeah, the <laughs> yeah, but we were both pleasantly surprised by the depth and quality of games on the list. So, William, as the author of that list, can you tell us a little bit about how you got to writing it, but kind of starting with what's kind of your history with like board gaming? How did you get into it? Is this something you've done in your entire life? Kind of what is your board game history? First off, how dare you for doubting my beautiful baby? <laughs> hey, yeah, <bro>. so, <laughs> better to doubt and be proven wrong than have high expectations and be disappointed. They send people to the gallows for less than that. No, that's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I've been basically a hardcore board gamer, a board game nerd I would identify as for my entire life. So um, I think that the two games that really you know, drove me into the hobby. We're playing Game of Thrones, the board game, playing Diplomacy, which I broke out uh, with my high school friends, uh, um, you know, early on in my board game career. So, um, yeah, and then I was uh, a journalist and freelance writer and a science writer, and I worked for Popular Mechanics um, from 2013 onward. And so I've been working with Popular Mechanics to update this list. And it's kind of just been... Uh, an evolution. So originally it wasn't the 15 best board games. I think we started by me just reviewing like maybe like five or 10, like top 10 new board games and it just kind of grew in popularity and also grew in size over time. So one thing that I, one question that I actually get a lot from readers is why is this in popular mechanic? Um, and I actually kind of have two answers for that, which is the first is that board games are kind of the perfect subject for popular mechanics, which is at its core, like a magazine about design and about how things work. And it's also the perfect name for a magazine if there was you were going to have a magazine that was only about board game reviews you would call it popular mechanics it's like the perfect name um and the second reason is that actually uh the second reason why we cover board games is that my editor for the story darren and i are just gigantic nerds so we both actually interned at the magazine at the same time and we played a huge number of board games in our free time after we met and i think back then i was dming like the worst possible campaign of dragon age the tabletop rpg with darren so, uh, you know, this is our, our love of all things board games just kind of boiled up in this list. Very, yeah. very cool. So when it came then to creating this list, like what was the process? Like how did you, did you just like write down a whole bunch of games you really liked and then just start whittling away? Or how did you, what was the process for coming up with these 50? Yeah. So the whole, as I said, the whole list and this process has kind of been evolving as I've been doing it. So maybe it's best for me to just explain what now and what maybe for the last three years I've been aiming at with the list. And then we can kind of get to how I've been formulating it since then. So what I'm trying to do with this list is put together a list of games from like the last three years or so uh, that kind of represent the cream of the crop across the full spectrum of light to heavy games, the spectrum of, you know, different types of game mechanics, and also the full spectrum of like board game players. For example, on my end, where I'm happy to spend eight hours playing Twilight Imperium 4th Edition to games that I can break out with novices to the hobby, like my family or my girlfriend's friends, games like Decrypto, Azul, Secret Hitler, Codenames, you know, uh, uh, games that, that always seem to win over uh, new players. And so it's kind of a, a hard balance to strike to just get a, a list that encompasses 
all of those games from the last three years, but that's pretty much what I'm going for. Um, and the reason that I'm trying to do this, or, or the reason that, you know, that's been evolved is that, uh, you know, Popular Mechanics has a pretty large online audience. And our search engine traffic is actually, you know, especially around the holidays, is kind of bonkers for this story. And I know that each year this list is saving some number of poor children or poor significant others or family members from getting, <laughs> instead of getting like the, a lame copy of Monopoly or Risk, they're getting something awesome. And truly, I am a saint for doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is one way to look at it. I will say for Christmas, I did get a uh, uh, card game called No Trumps because it was in the board game section of Barnes & Noble. Uh, so I, I appreciate this list and I will make sure everyone in my family sees it. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah, Barnes & Noble, I'd really like to talk to the the, I don't know, the media media conglomerate that gets to decide which board game they're selecting. Yeah, we also um, want them to be our sponsor. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love Barnes & Noble and I'm so glad Borders is dead. <laughs> That's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> so with so first just selecting these games um so you know with this like big ambition in you know in my head in my editor's head uh basically you know selecting the the right games is 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 you know it's, it's difficult as you might imagine for a couple different reasons first there's like seemingly like a billion new games every year and i neither have the time to play all of them nor do i actually feel comfortable asking board game publishers and designers to send me press copies without like a very solid hunch that I'm going to write about their games. So, you know, this is a 50 best board game list that I curate. I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not writing about the duds. They don't go on my list. And so to ask like a small game publisher, to, you know, to print a copy of their game and mail it to me for free is, is a lot. And I really do appreciate uh, that, you know, these board game publishers are doing this. So I, I, I really do do a lot of research before I ask for games, before I, um, you know, think that I want to put them on this list. So, I first, you know, I'll weigh like the basic facts about the game, like how heavy is it, um, what type of mechanics are involved, um, and usually, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look at other people's reviews, what people are talking about, what's being rated on Board Game Geek, uh, and basically, I can kind of create like a wish list, and then I'll go through that wish list, and I you know I weigh like the basic facts about the game because I want to make sure that I'm not just including all these extremely heavy board games that are rated super highly on. Board game geek. I want a bunch of different games that everyone will be comfortable playing. Um, so obviously, after after I, I create this wish list, I'll email out the, the publishers, and then I play all of these games. So every list that every board game that's on this list, I have played. Um, and I have a few different groups of friends that I review games with. People who promise to read the rules before we need to play. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, and you know, you normally we play these games enough times until we feel like we have a solid handle on them. So sometimes I can be like as few as like two or three times. Sometimes it takes us like five plays through before I really feel like like we can review it. Um, or and then, so usually at the end of each playthrough, um, myself and the, you know the group of friends that uh, I have that play these games with me, we talk about the game with a focus on really just the biggest and most simple question, which was was the game fun and what about it did we enjoy playing? And then based on that conversation. Um, uh, you know, so for, first off, most of the games that I request, um, uh, you know, are get sent to me and of the games that get sent to me, most of those actually make it on the list because I do feel like I do a pretty good job of, uh, you know, shuffling through all the different games that are coming out each year. Um, and then based on the discussions that we have after the game, I try to write just like two or three paragraphs on what might most capture the attention of the person that I think should play the game. And then I, you know, then I put it in a list. So the list is a stagnant 50 and I'm doing my best, especially this year to cut away games that are older than uh, three years, uh, uh, three years old with each new edition. Um, and of course there are games that I get and I play and I think, uh, that's not necessarily a game I'm going to recommend. And I always feel extremely guilty about that fact. Um, so when you actually look at the list of games too, so I don't actually rank the games, but I kind of rank them a little bit. So if you look at like the first listed game to like the 50th, like you travel down what's kind of like an algebraic continuum where the, the newest and like my current favorites are on top and like the oldest and like waning games are at the bottom with like both that newness factor and the goodness factor weighed uh, with basically no science at all, just with my gut. And that's just kind of how we, we come up with the list. I have an important question about your list. Yes. And my, and my question is a statement. And my statement is a title. <laughs> Human Punishment Social Deduction 2.0. What is this? <laughs> okay, wait. So I... Be 
we have infinite appetite for these social deduction games. Avalon, Secret Hitler, The Resistance. When someone, when I know that a new board game is coming out, like there's a new game that's coming out called Blood on the Clock Tower, and I'm like, I've like already emailed the the, the people that are designing it, like seeing when I can get to play it because I love recommending these games. Um, so Human Punishment is a social deduction game that's like half social deduction game, half like a card game. Okay. So it's 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 pretty strange. So you basically at the beginning of the game you get like three different cards and the cards tell you like all together the cards tell you like which team you're on. You're either on an outlaws team, you're on a machines team, you're on a humans team and your job is as you're playing the game, you're basically slowly flipping over people's cards and learning more information about them, but you're also listening to people and you're you're trying to like eliminate different groups. Like if you're the outlaws you want to eliminate everyone but yourself. If you're the machines, I think you only want to li- eliminate the humans. And every time someone dies, so the person who died like takes like a temperature check of the game and sees if like an end game has been triggered. So it's like this interesting social deduction game where mostly you're like listening to like what people claim they are. If they're claiming they're a machine, if they're claiming they're a human, usually people don't claim that they're outlaws. And but it's also just like a straight up card game that you're like pulling these like random cards that give you abilities from like a central deck. You have um like these guns that are on the table, like these little card guns. When we play, we made sure that everyone that picked up the gun, you had to hold it as if it was a gun and then you had to frantically point it at the person that you're uh, uh you're you're threatening to shoot. But yeah, no, it's I mean, I'm not it's it was made by some German designers. Is it like is this are you still not able to buy it? I remember yeah. when I first on it was like hard to get yeah after we went over your the list the first time we were like we looked through we were like we know every game on this list except for this game <laughs> so i mean, i looked it up and you couldn't order it at the time um it yeah, looks they, like they're doing a kickstarter but like the kickstarter closed and late pledges are not available yet so i don't think you can still buy it anywhere right now yeah so one of the things that i i hate mm-hmm. okay so that's actually a failing of mine i don't like putting these games up on this list unless i know that my readers can buy them because what is the point of telling people that a game is fun and you can't have it? Like what I, I like I failed on that one. I guess I was just really excited about it, so I just I sent the I sent the review in before that it was ready for people to buy. It. No, um, yeah, yeah. I talked about Wingspan like two months ago, and I was like, I know people can't buy this game, but I'm still gonna talk to you about it. <laughs> Wingspan is so much fun. Yeah, that was on. I put that. I think that's number one on my list right now. It is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So here's my next question. Then. So, so we clearly know the types of games that you enjoy. We've talked about that a little bit. Are there types of games or mechanisms or things that you're not as into and that maybe are a little bit more of a struggle for you or a game might have to work a little harder to get you in its good graces? You know, I would, I don't think so, but it's possible that, and I hate to say this out loud, that these like strictly Euro games over time, I'm just not having as much fun with them. The ones that aren't as immersive. So one of the games that I just put on my list is Brass Birmingham. And people are raving about this game. And I just, I found it somewhat disappointing, to be honest. Um, the game has like, it's, it's, you know, it's very strategy heavy, which, which I love. I'm a big fan of chess, but, I'm not sure. Uh, the rules were really fiddly and some of the decisions that you make early on kind of cascade in a way that you feel like maybe you can't, uh, provide like a proper long-term strategy for. So maybe I'm not, I'm not so hot on these like, uh, really abstract Euro games anymore. Um, I would say there's a couple other trends that I'm not a big fan of. Um, first is designing boxes so that all the components can't fit in a way that makes sense. (laughs) (laughs) Don't like that one. Don't like that at all. Um, I'm also, I'm not a fan of these like so, like, okay, so every new game now has like a solo variation, which is basically almost always boils down to a less fun version of playing the game with at least one other living human. And I'm not, I'm not so hot on these solo games. So you had mentioned that, you know, Brass Birmingham, you weren't totally, you know, thrilled with or maybe didn't weren't as smitten with as other games, but it still ended up on your list. Yes, yeah. Well, I played it with a big group of people and a lot of people loved it. And honestly, a lot of people I can see that this game has huge allure to a lot of different types of people. And although and it's possible that so when I say that it's disappointing, I was expecting this game to be on the top of my list when we played it. Uh and when we broke it out, it just wasn't, I don't know, it, there was, it was lacking something that I thought would make it like really spectacular. Maybe I'm being hard on the game. It was really fun. When we played, I liked the strategy. I just didn't think that it like 
was like a shining star. Gotcha. Are there any games on the list that you think don't get enough attention or aren't as appreciated as they should be? Um, yes. There's one game that I'm not sure if I, oh, I hope I really didn't cut this out with the last. Is Quantum still on my list or did I cut it out? Because it's getting, it's single. still on there. Yeah, it's still on there. It's still on, yeah. on my, um, Quantum is an absolutely fantastic game that I have never heard another person talk about. I've never heard anyone else bring it up. I've never heard anyone uh, uh, explain, like, but anyone put it on a list of their, like, favorite games or their favorite 10 years or whatnot. And it's it's this really interesting dice-based game where, I don't know how to explain it without just li- listing off the rules. Basically, you have these, like, starship, which are dice, and each of the starship can move the amount of distance equal to the number on the pips on the dice. So, like, a, you know, five pips means it can move five. And then you have them, like, fight against each other and uh, the strength of the dice is disproportional to the number of pips. So the, the one die is the strongest and you're, you're trying to surround planets uh, with uh, that all have like a certain number on the planet and you need to have dice that are exactly equal to that number so that you can take over the planet and you're basically just racing to take over the most number of planets. Uh, it's a really clever game and I really enjoyed playing it and I wish more people knew about it. I'm, I'm have you guys played myself. Of- <laughs> I saw it during the, the, the dog days of Toys R Us sitting on a clearance shelf, and I saw that, and I saw the like original like base X Files game from IDW, and I and I didn't get either of them. I, I was assuming I could come back and get them at a lower price, and was really kicking myself for not getting either of those games. Yeah, I've heard of it, but I have never played it at all, and I think it's pretty darn hard to come by these days. Yeah. Well, I, you don't I, see I, got kind of a, I got kind of a funny story that I'm not maybe sure if I should say, but, uh, so my, when, so when I was in, when I was, uh, uh, in grad school for journalism, my roommate, um, was writing a story about this board game designer. It was the gentleman that made the game. I, I don't have his name in front of me. Um, and so he actually got an advanced copy of quantum and we played it in our like tiny little apartment. Uh, maybe four or five times. And then my friend, uh, so then Ben was invited to, uh, the launch of this game. Um, and so we went to the launch of the game and we were surprised to find at the launch of the game that they were having a competition to play Quantum and whoever was able to win was going to be able to take the game home. Uh, and so we got randomly selected to be, in, uh, to be, uh, uh, in, you know, uh, uh, groups of four and Ben and I ended up being in the same group of four. Uh, and we had played this game like like five, maybe six times. So as soon as the game started, we immediately shot ahead. And then we kind of like, we, we, we kind of like, I don't know if colluded is the right word, but it's definitely the right word. We colluded <laughs> and we won the game and we got to take it home. So that is where my copy of Quantum comes from. From not cheating per se, but cheating in fact. <laughs> it's just taking advantage of a situation. You didn't cheat, I wouldn't say necessarily. <laughs> Were there any guidelines that said you couldn't have played the game before? No, there wasn't. But I do remember. I do remember when we sat down. One person said, "Hi, ah, have you guys ever played this before?" And my roommate Ben said, "Yeah, I played it before, and I just didn't say anything." <laughs> <laughs> And Josh knows how we feel about admitting information when it comes to whether or not you're being honest. (laughs) I don't know what you're talking about, Kyle. (laughs) Um, Any games... Sorry, Josh, if you have questions, feel free to jump in because I'm just running away with things. Any (laughs) Any games you would recommend... Uh, that maybe if somebody is getting newer into gaming, uh, because like, you know, our audience that we hopefully have about half fish video game listeners, half fish board game listeners with, you know, some overlap in between the two. Are there any games you recommend on your list that might be good for those who are just kind of thinking about jumping into the hobby uh, or just get exploring what board games might mean to them? So I guess the most important thing I would say to your uh, listeners is, for the love of goodness, don't go out and buy board games if you don't know that you're actually going to like the board game. I have a question for both of you guys. How many games do you have right now on your shelves that you have not yet played? <laughs> Uh, I don't want to answer that. <laughs> uh, over sixty. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably I'm not quite that bad, but probably in the forty-ish range. Why would you wish that on anyone? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if you don't know what type of board game you want to play, 
make your friends play their unplayed board games with you or their favorite board games, uh, especially if their names are uh, Kyle and Josh. And or <laughs> if you don't have friends that are really into board games, you, you really like board games, go to a board game cafe or a board game meetup and learn about the games that you want to play there. Don't just go out and gobble up games and then have them sit on your guilty conscience looking at you from their beautiful shelf and their their you know box is still covered in plastic. That's no one no one needs that. No one wants that. Well that's an important difference between Kyle and myself because I open every single one of my games and it drives me nuts that Kyle believes his in shrink wrap. Yeah I don't open them until I'm gonna play them. <laughs> I can't do it. It's like Christmas. <laughs> I have to if I buy a game I have to open it like right away. In fact my wife's copy of the Mystic Veil expansion is just sitting here unopened, and I'm like, I just keep looking at it. <laughs> Did you open it? Okay, she says she opened it. <laughs> uh, Josh, I've been dominating things. Do you have questions, thoughts? I'm going to cover the the listener questions. So oh, I'm okay. Just, I'm just on for the ride. All right. Well, here's my <laughs> next question then. So you had mentioned, William, that you weren't a big fan of games that had like this added solo variation in it that there's you know kind of the watered down version of the game what do you think about games that are designed just straight up to be like a solitaire style game so i wouldn't say that i'm not a fan of the games that have solo editions i'm just not i don't ever find the solo edition actually adds enough value to the game that i would Mm -hmm. consider purchasing it for that um solitaire style game i don't know i guess i i like I like board games because you're sitting at a table and you're with your friends, I think is, and then you're beating them and you're watching them for <laughs> your name <laughs> and you're lying to them. It's, it's about, it's about the warmth in the heart of just sitting around with a group of people you really care about and crushing their dreams. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, are there, are there any solo board games that you're a big fan of? I mean, the only game that I have played solo and I haven't played it solo enough yet to talk about on the podcast that I mentioned very briefly, Seventh Continent. Um, mm-hmm. It was a game that my wife was not super, wasn't super excited about potentially playing. She um, actually sleeved the entire game for me. And then after sleeving it was like, I don't really know if I want to play this. <laughs> so, which was, I, I really appreciated that she did that for me though. Uh, so I played that one solo and I enjoy playing that solo. I think the hard thing is, is that, and maybe because I play video games as well, is that anytime I have time to play a game myself, I tend to play a video game over a solitaire board game. I did back a game on Kickstarter and I'm blanking on the name of it. That the I should Abandons? Be, is that the one? I don't remember. I did. It was a solo, a solitaire only board game. Oh, um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, but like to, to kind of answer that question, I'm going to pull it up while I talk. I've only played role player solo um, because of the same reason. It's not, I don't think it's a theme that my wife wants to play. Um, but I don't, I feel like William, like I don't enjoy, you're thinking of Unbroken, Kyle. Yes, I, I don't enjoy um, solo games necessarily because I, the best thing about board games is being social with friends um, and having fun and laughing and in experiencing something together that you may not have done previously. Um, but that being said, I did, I also did back a game called The Abandons, a solo labyrinth escape game, which I just got, um, from Kickstarter like a week ago. So I am going to try playing that, but, um, it's the same thing. Like if I have time to play a game solo, it's probably a video game instead of a board game because you don't need to be social to do that. Yeah, the last board game I tried to play solo, I think was too many bones and I played for like two hours and uh, lost by myself in like a dimly lit room and it felt like <laughs> it felt like dying alone in the woods where like no one even cares or knows where you are I, I i don't know i didn't i didn't enjoy it that much um do you like do you like seven condom um for what i've played of it thus far i do um like i said i need to play it more and i think the thing that has prevented me from going back to it is that i played it for a few hours um over a couple days and then it was like oh i should get back to that oh i should get back to that and now i'm worried i don't remember how to play it and that's the thing that has been hesitating and having me go back because while it is a game that from a rule standpoint, it's like, all right, do kind of whatever you want. There's obviously a lot of, um, a lot of things on the cards and like all of just a shorthand for what things mean. I'm struggling that I, I'm not, I'm pretty confident I wouldn't remember all of that anymore. But from what I played of it, I did enjoy. I like the concept of, Hey, you're dropped on this island. You have this curse. Go ahead, figure out how to get rid of the curse and just, just go like wherever you wherever you want to go, whatever you want to do, just go do it. Obviously, within some some mm-hmm. guiding there. But uh, from what I played, I did enjoy. But like I said, I don't think I played enough of it to 
be able to fully review it or give like a full recommendation or not recommendation? Because I know it's on your list, so obviously you've played it. Yeah, I have played it. I really, you know, there's parts of it I like. The one thing that the one thing that I that I find strange about the game is that the allure of it is its replayability. Mm-hmm. But you start on that same island. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean that said, I like chess a lot, and you you know the pieces start at the same spot, and you have like the same like four opening moves for the most part. You're playing out over and over again, and then there's like the game gets more complex as time goes on. That said, you're on that island. I don't want to give spoilers, but maybe there's some poisonous gas that gets sprayed in your face. And you, as soon as it happens once, you like don't maybe you don't go on that card anymore. Maybe you learn your lesson. <laughs> very, very true. Um, one final question I wanted to ask, and then we'll get to the, some of the listener questions. And this one is kind of related to one of them. So in looking at your list, I think one of the biggest things that stood out to me is that there is not, and maybe it's because they're older, but a lot of the quote unquote evergreen games that you'd expect or that you hear people recommend to folks regularly, like none of them really are re- are represented other than maybe like you do a pandemic legacy season two on there. But like there's no pandemic, there's no Carcassonne, there's no Catan, there's none of those games that you always hear you know, take it to ride that people recommend to people constantly when it comes to games. Was that a conscious decision? Was it just because those games are too old? Why did none of those games make the list? Yeah, you know what? It's both of those things. It is a conscious decision. And the fact is that they just are too old. So the list is supposed to, you know, capture like the, uh, you know, the games that have come out over the last couple of years. And a lot of those games are early 2000s, late 2000s, or like mid 90s, like thinking of like Cook Zone at the time. Um, tick to ride. I love all of those games, but they just don't, they just don't cut the new. They're just not, they're not new games. Doesn't mean that they're not worthy of your time. It doesn't mean that I wouldn't recommend them to people. Um, doesn't mean that I don't play them. Uh, I play Tick to Ride on my phone so many times that it's just <laughs> like, oh my goodness, that's a, that is an addictive <laughs> app. Um, yeah, but they're just, they're just not new enough. I am, if there are expansions that come out for some of the games that I think of more as classics. So actually, one of the games that I'm hoping to re-review is Game of Thrones board game, which has new expansions, the Mother of Dragons expansion, and I uh, have the I haven't I haven't played it yet, but I'm hoping that I'll be able to play it sometime next month. Um, and I would I would like to find ways to bring some of those classics back onto this list by uh, using some of their expansion updates. Is there any? So, like, I was. I was going to say, is there any desire to you know have like your 50 new board game list, but then also have like 50 of all time? board game list you know if popular mechanics wants to keep paying me to tell people board (laughs) games for fun i will i will write as many lists as they want (laughs) as gamers we do love lists that is for sure yes awesome what do you guys i mean i have some questions for you guys wait how can i make this one how can i make this list better and two should i be ranking these games because in my heart i'm ranking them but on the list i'm they're not ranked and i see every like i'll look at the reddit threads when people post this thing on board games and people are always they always mention that it's not ranked or is right like what do you guys think how can i make this game uh how can i make this list better and what do you think about the rankings that's well, I, don't, I don't think you should rank it people want you to rank it so they can argue with you that's why they want you to rank it i think having a definitive list is good and the fact that you like almost like you quarterly update it like that's that's good enough i think um th- it's to improve it, I don't know that you that it necessarily needs to be improved um, because you go into a decent amount of depth with your experience of the games. Um, and like even when you were talking about Brass Birmingham with us, you you still cover in the article that it like what your what your concerns were. You still put that in the description. You just don't necessarily um, you know say you didn't like it. You just say like it, it's you know it can be fiddly. Um, with the rules and stuff. So that's good that that is in there. Uh, maybe if you just put a little bit more from your personal experience for the game, or even that, like, I didn't know that you played all these games necessarily. So um, if you could consider that a way to improve it, maybe, but I would not rank these because while we gamers do love our lists, gamers are also terrible <laughs> and they like to argue about everything. Yeah, when I look at that, I'm actually also glad it's not ranked um, in a number order because I think number one, like if I am not a fan of Euros and the number one game on the list is a Euro, well, immediately, how is that the best game? Like that doesn't make that would immediately, like Josh said, like people are just going to argue and fight about like what should be this or that. Um, The one thing I would that might be helpful and again, you can do whatever you want um, is if they were some way kind of categorized as far as style of game. 
like the, because the list right now just kind of runs through and it's like you know you have code names followed by gaia project like or even you know if you go you have star wars rebellion code names gaia project like those are three very different games so depending on stylistically if there's a type of game i want to get look look for or if there's like hey i'm like hey you know what i really want to play a new euro you know or i'm looking for a new euro to add to my collection if there was some sort of rough like categorization that might be helpful but outside of that and then even people might argue with you as to whether x game is you know that <laughs> category or not uh that would be the only type of like um categorization at all that i would want or ranking of any sort is just generally like me- by mechanism or style of game or something like that but yeah I, I thought about that i thought about maybe having like a like who should buy this game and then like semicolon and then people knew the games hardcore gamers or a bit of both like like do you think that that would that would like satiate that i think so yeah absolutely because yeah if you know if it's (laughs) if you like look at you're like wow the cover for the box art for twilight imperium looks really sweet i want to get that game and i've never played a board game before might not be the best option yeah you could also include the complexity score from board game geek too if that could be a possibility something that you could include in that which is the level of complexity yeah so like people know like yeah exactly but I mean, for better or for worse, like I've had people at work now because I kind of ha- I'm kind of known as the person who plays games and stuff. Ask about like, oh, what game should I get or like what games to look at? Like your list is the list I send to people now. Like it is my de facto list that I share with people when they're like, what game should I get or what are good games right now? Like this is the list I share. So it, it means a lot to hear that, Kyle. Thank you. But awesome. Josh, <laughs> sir, we have some listener questions. We do. And uh, scanning them, we... We did answer at least one and maybe more. So uh, if we answered it, um, we can just address that it was answered. But uh, our first question comes from uh, Kevin Austin from uh, via Twitter. Um, so the first thing he asks is, did you play all these games on this list? And uh, his second question is, what was the hardest part about compiling those? So you're damn right, Kevin. I played all these lists. I uh, played all these games. <laughs> Uh, I, I want all the readers to know that I was told I shouldn't yell at or curse the uh, the readers asking questions uh, <laughs> by, by the two podcast hosts before this podcast, uh, and I'll do my best to follow through with that. I say the hardest part of that this list is that frequently. So I, I have a full time job. I work at the U.S. Embassy in Rwanda. Uh, I'll like get home from like a full day of work, and then I'll have like my own self appointed homework of spending one to two hours to learn the rules of a brand new game. And so I'm like learning a lot of like rules for new games, but it can only get so easy. You still have to like read the whole manual. Um, So I'd say that that is probably the hardest part. Um, Second hardest part might be that sometimes I don't really get to play my favorite classic games anymore, to be honest, because like my board game time is devoted into like jumping into these, these new ones that I have, you know, I only have like a limited amount of time to spend on board games. And I want to make sure that, like we're, I know I'm updating this this list uh, every two to three months with maybe something in between like four and six games. So that's like a lot of new games that you got to break out and learn the rules, get a bunch of people together, play it a couple of times. So I can't really like, I would love to play, um, love to play more like Catan to be honest, or any, any of these other classic games. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, Cult of the New really just squashes your favorite games. <laughs> Yeah, I really want all your readers to feel bad for me for getting all of these games for free and then <laughs> telling people that they're fun. Everyone should really just pity, pity me because I truly am the hero of this story. It should be your tagline <laughs> at the end of the article. <laughs> pity me. Yeah, yeah. Please, I have a Patreon. You can just yeah. support me. <laughs> uh, all right, so our next question comes from Josh Blig uh, on Twitter at, at no Delicious. Uh He, he asks... Uh, if you were to create a, quote, welcome to the hobby starter kit, uh, unquote, of five to ten games, what would you include? Um, if not titles, how would you recommend someone build their library as they're still figuring out what uh, niche they're in, they enjoy the most? So I think we covered this a, a little bit in that I really don't think that any of my readers or any of your listeners should buy games without uh, playing them first or playing them with friends if they're just kind of looking to, like, uh, build a library of games. Yeah. Um, that said, I think there are a couple of evergreen games that I have, uh, especially uh, games that are on this list. So new games, maybe evergreen is the wrong word, that I have found that people really love. So I think that everyone should own a copy of Secret Hitler. Um, you should own a copy of Code Names. You should own a copy of Decrypto, which is a brand new game that I just put on this this most recent update. Uh, 
which is super fun. And there's a fourth game that I wrote down at one point. I can't remember what it was. So you should only buy those three games and you shouldn't buy anything else. <laughs> That's a good starter list for sure. I've heard great things about Decrypto. I want to, I want to get that and give it a oh, shot. Is great. And then oh, we have Elium85 uh, from our Discord uh, chat who asks, um, what trend on board gaming do you hope grows slash continues to mature? And what trend do you hope dies i paraphrase that part <laughs> um i think that these legacy games are really fascinating and i do like watching the games that you play evolve over the play and like the, your, the decisions that you make um really having a big impact on the game gloomhaven isn't a, a gloomhaven isn't technically a legacy game but it's like the it's like definitely a legacy game right yeah it has the heart of a legacy game for sure and I, I don't know. And there's something about that that's just so much fun. It's like an extra layer of RPG on top of the RPG. And so I really like that. Um, what I think should die is, um, I'm not sure about that. You know, like, I'm, I, with the exception of designing boxes where all the pieces don't fit in and, and making everything have a solo, uh, a solo play variant. Other than that, like, I think, I think I feel pretty neutral about that. I figured out what the fourth the fourth game everyone needs to buy is, and it's Azul, for sure. Yes, yes, I agree with that. So, really quick, I just want to kind of build off that, since you talked a little bit about legacy games. Have you played either Seafall or Charterstone? No, I have not. Have you played either of them? Um, I've played, I finished Charterstone, I have Seafall, but it requires three people, so it hasn't been played. Because I was just curious if you had thoughts on playing legacy games that have, like, an established franchise behind them, like Pandemic Legacy where you kind of, most people playing it know how to play Pandemic, whereas a game like Charterstone like, is a completely different game that you've never played before. And if you had any thoughts on, you know, legacy versions of existing or compared to, you know, new legacy games at all. Yeah, maybe, I, I, honestly, it's new to who, though. Because, like, I'm playing Betrayal Legacy right now with mm-hmm. my group of friends, and all of us, this is our first experience with the betrayal genre at all. So we're mm-hmm. all playing it for the first time. So it might as well be Seafall or some other one of these right. legacy games that are brand new. Gotcha. Yeah, because I just assumed, and pro- my bad, this is what happens when you assume, I just assumed you had played the betrayal games before. <laughs> Basically, any game before 2015, there's like not a great chance that I, there's like some chance that I've played it. And then like every game after like 2015, <laughs> I've like played all of them. That's like, that's like, the, the, that, as you might imagine, that's when I started doing this list. Right. Yeah, because the thing we talked about a little bit when it came to like Charterstone was the fact that since you don't know how to play even like the quote unquote base version of the game, well, because it's not a game you've played before, like it's very possible to make mistakes just in the normal like n- playing of the game, not even withstanding from the legacy aspect of it of like, oh, now you have to do this stuff that, you know, moves on from game to game to game so if you make a mistake playing the game just because you haven't played it enough to know the ins and outs that potentially could have you know long-term ramifications you know in game six that you messed up like just because you made a mistake of basic rules in game two you know so so this actually brings up something that i want to amend an earlier reader response that i that i gave which is uh things that game designers and game publishers can do to improve games something that i would that i would like to see more of is extremely well written rule books and good rule reference sheets. So even like the best game can be made better with like a really good rules reference sheet. Even if you're not constantly using that, that's something that there's, there's nothing that kind of breaks up the gameplay, especially these like immersive storytelling games more than where you stop the entire game and you have to go into like an online FAQ or you have to like open up a rule book and then you're like going through to try to find out how exactly, like, whether or not I was allowed to throw this grenade, or whether or not you were able to stop me beforehand, like, that, like, that breaks everything up. So I would, I, uh, that was something that I would definitely like to see. Yes, every game should come with a quick reference card or sheet for every player. I, it boggles my mind that that doesn't happen with every game. Excellent. All right. Josh, do you have any other questions before we kind of head towards home here? No, I don't have any more questions. I mean, you, I mean, we covered pretty much Every question that I had while reading this or 
<laughs> questions I didn't even know I had. <laughs> William, as we kind of start rounding the corner here, is there anything else you'd like to discuss before we kind of bring the show to a close? No, I just want to take a moment to thank both of you guys for having me on. Honestly, I love playing board games. I love talking about board games. And I'm just so happy that I was able to you know, talk about this, this this list and all these like great games with you guys. And I hope that maybe you have me on for a, f- a future board game update. You are welcome on whenever you'd like to, no matter what times we have to record at based <laughs> off of where you are in the world. We're, we're always happy to have you on. So, all right. As we finish things up here, we are clearly a gaming podcast, but we want to give you one recommendation, suggestion, or thing we are currently doing outside of board games or video games that is helping us live a well-rounded life. Now, William, do you have a recommendation for everyone, or would you like Josh and I to go first to give you time to think about it? Um, I'm learning a new language right now. So I live in Rwanda in Central Africa, and I'm learning Kenya Rwanda, uh, which is the local language that they speak here. And learning a new language is one of the best things that you can do for your brain and the best things you can do for your spirit, and it's awesome. And it's like, in some ways, it's also like a game, except a game where you're constantly looking up the rules uh, and there's no reference sheet and it's very hard for people laugh at you. But learn, learn another language. All right, so here's going to be my follow-up question to that. Since you are a much wiser and smarter person than Josh and I, and oh, are thanks far... for pausing after you said Josh <laughs> and I, and are far that was cutting. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just for effect. It's fine. And you're far more well traveled. I mean, you work at the U.S. Embassy in Rwanda, like. You're clearly like a more important person than either of us. Is there a language you would recommend that people learn just based off of your perspective of what's going to be important for people to know in the future? All right. I fundamentally disagree on every point that you said before, <laughs> except all the points where I'm awesome. Those I really like. <laughs> um, definitely the language that you should learn moving forward is English. If you don't know it, you've got to just get a solid handle on it. <laughs> Well, looks like I got to get that one down. (laughs) Yeah. I I, I don't know. Learn Chinese so that your feudal overlords that we're going to have in 30 years, we're able to service them in the best way possible. I I have no idea. Um, Teach our kids Chinese. Probably. probably, (laughs) Yeah. French, Spanish, or uh, Klingon. One of the the, the three. All right. I know which one's going to resonate with our listeners. (laughs) Josh, do you have any recommendations, sir? Yeah, it's going to show my age. Uh, or maybe it won't. Uh, my recommendation is uh, get a record player and some vinyl and listen to music the way it is meant to be listened to. <laughs> and that's, uh, I'm sure, a controversial statement. <laughs> but um, my, I got a gift, that I want to say, for my birthday a few years ago of, of my record player. Uh, we had to put it away because the baby was uh, constantly hitting start and stop and ruining the needle. But um, once we find room to put it back up, uh, it's just something that when you take the time to physically put your music on instead of opening up your phone or saying like Alexa play something, uh, I think that you can really uh, appreciate the music more. And for me, like growing up with records in the house, it really is like a cathartic experience almost like it, it's just very relaxing and soothing. And I'll sit down and not do anything and just, you know, put on a record or like the Westworld soundtrack while we're playing a board game, like have it on the record play in the background. And like having to get up and flip to the other side is, is really a, a interesting and, and fun experience for me. Some people will find it annoying, but I, I enjoy it. <laughs> awesome. I, I totally agree. I think it gives you an excuse to just sit down and like listen to an album. Like, I don't know. I, whenever, maybe for like the past couple of years, when I listen to music, I'm doing something else. I'm like very rarely listening to music for the sole purpose of listening to the music, you know, thinking about it, appreciating it. I think that like putting on a record really just allows you to do all that. Yeah. And you can't really move around because it'll start skipping on you. <laughs> <laughs> Put on a record and have a bad record player. <laughs> yeah. Just jump around and see if you can get that needle to move. <laughs> So uh, interesting that you mentioned that because I just started watching uh, Umbrella Academy last night. Just watched yeah. the first episode of it. So that is not my recommendation because I only watched the first episode. But as soon as the theme for this started, I was like, wow, this theme is like really interesting. It's really powerful. Like, I wonder who's doing this because it sounds like moderately familiar, like not in the oh, I've heard the song before, but just like it, it, it felt like something I had heard before. And then I, as watching the credits, saw that the music was by Jeff Russo. And Jeff Russo is the person who did the soundtrack for What Remains of Edith Finch, 
which is oh. an amazing, amazing soundtrack. And he also happens to be in the band Tonic, but he also did it like the TV show like Fargo and all these other things. He's much less in the touring with Tonic phase of his life and much more in the, hey, listen to this awesome music that I'm composing phase of his life. But yeah. His his stuff is really, really good. I really enjoy Jeff Russo. So there's an easy recommendation. That soundtrack. Get it on vinyl. What remains of Edith Finch soundtrack? It's amazing. <laughs> All right. So hey, my well rounded life. Gotta stay on brand. I'm gonna recommend a documentary. <laughs> Gotta stay on brand with this. And that is the documentary Minding the Gap. It is on Hulu currently. If you have that, you can watch it there. It starts out as uh, a skating documentary. It's a uh, uh, some kids who skateboard a lot and it kind of is just documenting their life. Uh, because one of the kids in the group just liked to record everything. So he just kind of took a camera with him and uh, recorded all of the stuff that they did. So when the when the documentary starts, you're kind of like, hmm, this is really interesting. Like, why do I care about a skating documentary? And it transitions not too far into it to you realize that they're going to be talking about some quite a bit heavier stuff. And that all these kids definitely had some things in their lives, either early um, or currently, that is pretty heavy. And that's a spoiling thing, but it definitely transitions to look at the role that violence plays in the upbringing of children and in the upbringing of kind of like how our family norms are created um, and just kind of that role and the impact that it has long term on on folks. So. Uh, it starts out very lighthearted with some kids skating uh, and it kind of transitions into some pretty heavy topics with some really interesting interviews and discussions um, and some really, you know, insightful looks at people's lives and kind of how the idea of like, do we, you know, follow in our parents' footsteps and do what, you know, do we mimic and do what we saw our parents do? So uh, it can be a little bit heavier and depending on, you know, your past experiences or or the things you've had in life might be a hard watch for sure. Um, but I think it's really well done. A uh, really interesting documentary that takes some turns. You don't expect it to. That is Minding the Gap on Hulu. So with that, William, hey, thank you so much for joining us this week. Where can people keep up with you on the Internet and all the awesome things you are doing? Uh, so thank you very much for having me, guys. Uh, people can tweet angrily at me at at Herkovitz, which is spelled as it's pronounced, a, some, a jumble of... Uh, uh, consonants with a couple of vowels in between um and they can uh follow my board game list at uh, popularmechanics.com awesome hey josh what do you say we wrap this show up i do did you like my uh, my cake is done siren going off in the middle of your <laughs> plug for... hey you, you get cake that's okay <laughs> Uh, so thanks for joining us everyone uh, in addition to finding us on twitter and instagram at board with vg you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash board with Fiji. Uh, so feel free to give us a five star rating over there. Also, if you want to communicate in the more long form, uh, where you're not feeling social media, feel free to email us at our fanfiction inbox known as board with VG at gmail.com. Uh, we tag our stuff with hashtag, hashtag board with Fiji. So please use that hashtag and let us know what you guys are up to. Um, and whatever podcast service uh, you're listening to us on, we encourage you to give us a stellar rating. That is whether you're downloading us from the PSVG feed, the Dice Tower Network feed, or our own standalone board with video games feed. We're everywhere, it seems. Uh, you, you can don't find give me, these guys uh, a five-star review. It will <laughs> hunt you down. That Thank is a promise. You. He's going to hug you down. Hug you down. <laughs> <laughs> Just turn that mistake into a phrase. I'm going to hug you down. <laughs> you can find me on Xbox Live and PlayStation Network as Why So Serious. That's S I R R I U S. Uh, and Kyle, where can they find you? So you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, PlayStation Network, Xbox Live, Board Game Geek, all at Psychocross, C Y C O C R O S S. Big thanks again to our special guest, William Herkovitz. As always, if you have suggestions for future topics, be sure to reach out to us on the social media because we want to talk about what you want to hear about. And remember, everyone, whether it be board games or video games, never stop gaming.